Beyond the Fairway podcast, Will, man, look, we have an absolute treat for our listeners and viewers today, Will. Jim Thorpe is joining us, man, and really a man that don't need no introduction. No, not at all. The legend, Jim Thorpe, the, the, I mean, one of the best to ever do it, one of my heroes, one of my iconic figures in, 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 in my eye, and uh, I mean, I just to think that, you know, the conversations that, you know, that we, we're going to have and talk about and the past and the present and his thoughts on what's, what's cracking as far as uh, today's, uh, the landscape of golf. Yeah. Man, this guy right here, man, I, I'm excited for sure. No, no question. And look, everybody out there, Will and I owe you like our sincerest thank yous, man. Look, we have made it through the first season of Beyond the Fairway podcast. This is the season finale, and there's no other way to close out, Will, our first year than with this man who really, he don't need no introduction, Will. He don't. But you know what? We might as well give it to him. Yeah, man. Yeah, we got uh, the legend. Um the the guy who has four arms as if he was a blacksmith. The uh the guy has the helicopter finish, uh who who uh who's not last name Palmer. This guy right here is a is a great Jim Thorpe. Beyond the Fairway Podcast, Will, it has been a year, but we go send it out only way the only right way to do it. Mr. Jim Thorpe is here with us. Mr. Thorpe, what's happening, man? Man, I'm just hanging out, playing a little bit of golf, enjoying this retirement life. So let me ask you a question. You know, I, I know you've been removed from the game for for a few years now. Are you still? Do you still have a competitive edge? Oh yeah, yeah. You know what? I played my boys there. Put them up. We played four or five times a week, and you know they end up spending a couple hundred dollars, man. So uh, the game is there. They're just the idea. I don't have that desire to work at it anymore. So basically, what you're saying that they're still paying some of your bills. Oh, no doubt about it, man. That's the only way to go. No <laughs> doubt about it. I got some guys here. They carry these two or three handicaps that like to shoot, you know, 88 or one, and that ain't going to get it done. <laughs> never going to get it done. No not with you. Not with not, not no. you around. Not with them hands. Not with no them hands. It, guys. Hey, Jim, I want to go back a little bit as we get started here in our conversation. I want to talk about your family dynamic that you grew up with in because you're one of 13 and – if I'm not mistaken, you have four brothers that also were hell, hell of a good golfers. So tell me a little bit of what it was like growing up. No doubt about it. First of all, we grew up in the Carolina, the little town called Roxburgh, North Carolina. My dad was a green superintendent of the golf course called Roxburgh Country Club. And yeah, there was five of us brothers. Uh, it was actually 14 of us. I think <clears throat> mom might have lost two at birth, you know what I mean? But there was 14 mm -hmm. that she had born and uh, seven girls and... Uh, Five boys survived, and my brother Albert, who was the oldest, uh, then Chuck, Bill, and Chester, and I was probably the weakest golfer of all of them. Uh, oh, and you admit? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Rewind. You said you were the weakest golfer at all yes, of them. Yes, I'm the weakest golfer. Of all of, uh, all my brothers. Unfortunately, I lost Chuck and Bill and Albert, so Chester's left. But you know, for some reason, I, I, I think what happened, they had the talent, had the looks and you know, the things that, that you know, professional athletes need. But I think I had the heart. Mm. And, and and sometimes the best players, I mean, you, 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 hey, you guys have played the game. Sometimes the best players don't win. And I think in my case, because I had the desire and the heart that over, you know, that overruled that lack of talent that I didn't have because I had, you know, the Hollywood finish and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it was my way. And I, I never forget when I went, when I told my brother I was going to try to qualify for the PGA Tour, my brother Chuck had already been on the tour. And he said to me, listen, when you can beat the boys at home, you can take your game on the road. Ooh. Mm. So when I started to beat the boys at home and went a lot of uh, open state events and that sort of stuff, and I, really when I start beating him, that's when I knew I had a chance. You know what I mean? Because I thought Chuck was a magnificent player, man. My brother Chuck and Bill, and and, and I, hey, I'm not exaggerating. But back in the day, these guys drove the ball 300, 325, 30 yards back in the days with the old equipment, man. What year was that? What, what, what year was? Bill and Chuck both had magnificent golf swings. What year, what year was that when you said back in the old days with the old equipment? Oh, was back that? in the mid-60s, man. Back in the mid-60s, early 70s. I mean, it's Jeez. a beautiful thing to watch, man. And, uh, 
it's no telling how many miniature events and that sort of stuff that Chuck and Bill won, man. I mean, and I used to just watch them play and just, just can't believe what I was watching there. You know, they drove it straight, they drove it long, they, they, they hit it close to the pin, they was good putters. Uh, but something was missing. I didn't never quite figure out what was missing. Maybe they didn't care enough, didn't want it bad enough. You know, we have a look. We have a lot of good golfers out there, but a lot of the guys don't enjoy the traveling, the leaving the family behind, and that sort of stuff. Where I think in my case, as long as I knew that my girls and the wife was doing fine and that sort of stuff, I was okay to go. I mean, I could go for six, seven months in a row. It didn't really bother me, as long as I knew they was okay because that was my way of making sure I got them educated and, you know, had a nice lift and that sort of stuff. And uh, it worked out. And plus, guys, you know what? In order to play the first thing golf, you need someone strong with you. You need somebody that believes in you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Versus complaining about, you know, having a bad day or a bad round. You know, my wife would say, work harder. All right? And... and uh, when we first met, I thought I wanted to pursue the game of golf, and she says, you know, I'm in your corner, but you have to work at what you're going to do. And that's basically what happened, man. I mean, I worked hard. And my first trip to the Q School, I marched right through, baby. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I, right I'm through. sure some folks one out day. here right now want that, one, want that uh, one experience. And done. I, so you, you know, you know, you just, you just mentioned, you know, man, so many places I want to go. I want to talk about your time at Morgan State playing football, but uh, you just you just talked about uh, working hard. So, and I'm I'm me. Doug is more neutral, Jim, and I'm the guy that's kind of messy, right? So super messy. I'm super messy. So you know, you're talking about a level of commitment. Now, when we talk about the, the guys today, the younger guys, do you see that same level of commitment coming from the younger players? No. The guys that have that the level of commitment is guys like Tiger Woods, guys who are just raising the bar. I mean, uh, John Rahm, he's got that level of commitment. Uh, uh, I'll tell you something. If, if Dustin Johnson had that same commitment that Tiger had, there's no telling what this guy could win, man. Dustin's got solid talent, buddy. Okay. But uh, Tiger, let me say, uh, um, yeah, I met Tiger when he was very, very young. And I knew then he was something special, you know what I mean? Didn't think he'd be quite as special as it turned out to be, but uh, yeah. you know he was special. And plus, he had the uh, you know, had his dad there, and that gave him that motivation that, that 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 he needed. And I think what happened there, and I'm just this is my <coughs> perspective, is that <clears throat> Earl never give in. He kind of told Tiger what he needed to do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How he. You know, see, sometimes you you know you kind of want people to to agree with you. It's just like when I used to hire a caddy to work with me, right? If my caddy agreed with everything that I said, then I didn't need him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't need him. I mean, I can't be right with everything I say. You know what I mean? So yeah, I do. And, and so, and I think that's what's missing with our young crowd. You know what I mean? It, it, it is something missing that we can't put our hands on. You know what I mean? Because hey, well, Jim, listen, not to change the subject, but we got some young brothers out there getting solid play. That's where I was going. But when they get in position to prove themselves, man, they fall by the wayside. Why so is that, Jim? I'm trying to do now is we need an Af African American, a minority golf academy. We want to find, we, we listen, we want to take these kids from point A to point B, and not just on the golf course. We want to get into their head, get up in here. You know, if you can control what's up here, you know what I mean? You know, I'll never forget listening to some of, some of the great. You know, your, your great players, Sam Snead, Ben Hogan. And and I, I think I said to Jack Nicholas once, I said, who who was the one guy on the last nine holes of a golf tournament that you didn't want to battle with, that you didn't, you know what I mean? And he looked at me and said, myself. Man. He said, if I can control myself, he said, I can't control what the other golfers are doing back there, but I can control what I'm doing. So that makes all the sense in the world. So I think what we need to do with the, uh, let's just say African American Golf Academy, mm -hmm. because we don't have one and we do need one. We can use we can use Jim and Dent. We can use with Nate Powell. We can use Adrian Steele. We can use uh, Lee Carter, uh, Bobby Strobers, Arthur Johnson, guys who have been there and know what it's mm -hmm. like marching down that back nine. You know, with, 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 you know when they say the pressure is there. Now, pressure to me. It's only when you have not prepared yourself. 
All right. <laughs> when you prepare yourself, I don't care what you do in life. If, if you could then prepare yourself, there's no such thing as pressure. See, because we play a game where you, it's the only game in the world where you can miss and win. Mm-hmm. It's not how good you play golf. It's how good you miss. So if you can learn to play from your misses, you can win. I mean, I've, I've seen guys, I beat guys on the golf course where I've driven the ball all over God's creation. You know, they hit it down the fairway on the green, two putt and go to the next hole. I hit it down the left side in the rough, knee high, hack it on the green somewhere at 25 or 30 feet and make the putt. Mm. You See, know? I wish I could putt. Then, that's, that's me. That's Will's problem. He could never make that putt, Jim. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> hey Jim, Jim, I gotta ask you though because I, there, you 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 said a lot, and I wanna I wanna spend some time on some of the things you were talking about, but but I need to understand a couple things about back in the day, back in the in the UGA in the in the Chitlin circuit. I wanna know, you know, from your seat, what was that like to to be a black man in the in the late seventies? You know, Sifford had already broke the color barrier on the PGA Tour. Lee Elder was was making his mark. But for you and playing the UGA, what was that like? How difficult was it getting from town to town, course to course? Well, first of all, I didn't play that many events on the UGA tour because I wanted something different, man. And basically what I seen there, yeah, hey, I, hey, I watched Charlie and, and Lee and Ted Rose and, and my brother Chuck and Bill and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And to me, uh, uh, it was a learning experience. But on the other hand, it was it, it, it wasn't taking you to where we where we were trying to go, all right. Uh, you know the PGA. There are some clause there where if you were a man of color, whatever the situation might have been, that you could not play. But we knew time would you know. And, and, and first of all, let me say we thank God for Charlie Sifford and Lee Elder and the Ted Rose, those guys who who stood up and fought for the rights to play in those events, all right. And uh, when I came along, there was yeah, there was a golf course I, I I could not play. There was golf, there was clubhouses I could not go in. Mm-hmm. But then we threatened with lawsuits and went on down the line and that sort of stuff, and things started to open up a little bit. But uh, to go out there and play, basically what you had, listen, you had some hell of a golfers out there, man. You had James Black. James Black was one of the best players that ever lived, man. I'm telling you, magnificent ball striker. I mean, you, you I mean, you had uh, Jimmy Walker. Uh, you had Nate Starks, you know, you had George Johnson, Pete Brown. I mean, you had some guys that you could really learn from. And the most of us learned in the caddy. And the most of the guys that played those events that you're talking about came out of the caddy yards. Mm-hmm. So what happened, listen, being a brother, a, a, being an African-American young man, the only thing we ever needed was a chance, all right? And once, it, once we got that chance, we could excel with it. So... Now, what's, what, what, what was taking place, they eliminated a lot of the caddy programs. That's why today we only have two men of color, and that's Tiger and Harold Barna that's playing the PJ Tour, all right, because they eliminated the caddy program. We learned through the caddy program. Mm. That's how a lot of us made it to the PJ Tour. When I joined the PJ Tour back in 19, in the early 1970s, there was 12, 13 guys out there playing, man. And that's crazy. Like, well, so Jim, there's 12, 13 guys. That's what you just said, you know. And not to exclude Joseph, Joseph Bramlett and Cameron Champ, uh, current tour members as well. But where 13 guys that you'd see week in and week out trying to play the tour? What happened? Why do we not see that in this era? And well, I'm sorry, I had to jump in there, man. That was one. No, no, it's right. like, he, he took the word It's crazy to mouth. think that we're talking about the 70s and the 80s, right? And now we in the 2020s. And there's more brothers, Jim, that you say and play then than play now. Right. I totally agree. Listen, being honest, I don't know what happened. We have a lot of wonderful programs. I mean, we have Selena Johnson has a beautiful program in Detroit. Glad I thought that Dallas, Texas has a wonderful program. Elijah Walker did one in Atlanta. And then we had the first chief program. And we don't know what happened to these young people. We don't know where they go once we get them to that stage to where they can compete. And, uh, I have no idea what the problem, and I, I think one of the major, listen, golf is a very expensive game, as you know, very expensive game. But I mean, I remember back in the day, man, we put five or six guys on the car with a suitcase and golf club, and we got to the golf room, and somehow we made it work. Yeah, you know, we checked into a hotel. There might have been eight of us in a hotel room, man. But you know what? We made it work. And i tell you what happened then that I don't see today. 
we had unity, man. You know what? We talked to one another about what we need to do. I never get, I never get, I, you know, I was strong, man, playing golf and all that sort of stuff. And, but man, I couldn't drive the golf ball on the 10 acre field. But I would sit down and talk to Calvin Pete, you know, who was one of the straightest hitters you've ever seen. I don't, I don't remember, I played with Calvin for 10, 12 years. I don't remember ever seeing Dagger missing a, a fairway. I, I don't remember ever seeing him missing a fairway. But we would sit and talk about the things we need to do, you know what I mean? Because you, we're always looking for something, and I can go into it about, you know, the golf ball, the golf club, the equipment, how you could change the equipment, all that sort of stuff to make the ball go straighter, to go right, go left, and that sort of stuff. That be- that was before the graphite shafts came along because the steel shafts, you could you could you could bend that thing, you open the club face or close the club face and that sort of stuff. But Kevin Pete was was super unique, you know. He had a I think he broke his arm when he was a young man. And uh, but the one thing he did that people don't understand why he hit the ball so straight, Calvin repeated everything. He repeated the same swing. So whether it's right or wrong, you know, you swing your swing, I swing my swing, and if you learn to repeat that, we can make it work. Yeah. But listen, guys, we have to find a way before I leave this earth to try and level the playing fields. I mean, it, it's been it, it's it, I don't understand it from the from the from the young lady standpoint, from the young man. And we probably have 14 or 15 young men out there today that are super talented, have a lot of talent. But you know what? Something happens when we get them into those events. I I, I, I can't quite pinpoint what, what is going on in their head. So I think what we need to do, I don't think we need to work on their golfing skills because we know they can hit the ball, they can drive it, they can chip it, they can putt it. We got to work on what's, between, what's going on between the ears, okay? So basically what I'm trying to do, trying to say to you guys, you can't tee up on the first tee or the second tee and say, okay, number five is a power five. I should be able to burn it there. Or number nine is a power five. If I can get past number nine, I got the game beat. No, no. You started the, you started number one tee and you take it a shot, a shot, a shot at a time. And this is what's going to get you over. You can't worry about what the other guys are doing around you because you can't control that. So, so you know, you know, Mr. Thorpe, you know, you guys kind of, you, Den, uh, George Johnson, James Black, you guys had a, um, I mean, you guys had, you, you guys faced some, 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 some controversy. You guys had a lot of things thrown at your way that were unfair, that were almost to the point that was unruly. It, you can't imagine. And the young, the younger generation today, be honest, we're not facing that. You know, because of you guys, the likes of what you guys did, you guys paid the way for us. But do you feel that in a way that we may be getting coddled in a way? You know, do you feel that we are, are we are we is there a level of um, soft? Are we soft? soft. I didn't right. want to say it, but are I'm glad soft? you said it. Doug. Are, are we soft? Are, are these because guys because soft? because from a physical <laughs> standpoint, from a physical standpoint, when I speak to Kamayu Johnson, speak to Willie Mack, speak to uh, uh, the, uh, the Sh- young man, Shaz just Avery Hart. Uh, yeah, Shaz yeah. Every Hart. They're they're hitting the ball oh, as yeah. pure as pure as day. But but you, like you said, it's, it's it's in the it's in the between the ears. Where are we? What what is that you think? Is is it they just didn't go through the rigmarole that you guys went through? Listen, we was diehards, man, all right? You had to beat us. I mean, we weren't going to lay down and give it to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You had to come on with it. You had to beat us. I'll never forget, man, 1986, two men of champions, La Costa, California. I get paired with Calvin Pete and Marco Muir the last round. You know what I mean? And I knew my game was tight because, you know, 68, 67, 68. I mean, my, my game is tight. And I went out there and uh, started, started number one. I mean, listen, I shoot six to six, and Calvin Pete beat me by four. All right? Ooh. When I shoot six to six on Sunday, and Calvin Pete beat me by four. I never seen – he had determination. He wasn't afraid. And I never – and you know what? He, he would flag hunt every shot he had. He would flag hunt. And these young guys, they, they don't play that way, man. I mean, I have no idea <clears throat> why they don't go out there and just – Listen, what can you do? You either, I mean, you stay on the practice till you beat ball at the ball at the ball, right? Right. Yeah, I used to. Take it yeah. to the golf course. You have to take your practice tee game to the golf course. You know, and go play. It's nothing to be afraid of. But, but, but Jim, Jim, they are afraid because they, they, they don't have the finances and some of the... Uh, hey, wait, the, wait, 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 stop. We didn't have the finances. That is true. 1981, I was leading the U.S. Open. I could not afford to buy breakfast. 
I stuck in my car for six straight nights. At the USO? I took a shower in the locker room. And was that way for that year? had fruit in the locker room, apple and oranges. Hell, I couldn't have ate that week. I'm telling you, man. So, listen, I have been there. The only corn I had in my pocket was the Indian head pinning that my daddy gave me years ago that I used to mark my balls with. I had no money. So, you know what? We have used that for excuses for years, man. But these guys, listen, back in the day, we just needed to get there. And as long as our entry fee or green fee was paid, man, that's all we needed, pal. I mean, you didn't need three both thousand dollars in your pocket. You just, hey, you just need enough money where you get there and go. The younger generation we have today, they all got talent. We know that. Mm -hmm. All right. I remember years ago, I used to have Ginger Howard when I was with Callaway Golf. I used to do outings. Mm -hmm. And if there was a lot of, you know, going to be a lot of female golfers there, I would call Ginger Howard. And because Ginger Howard could play, man, mm -hmm. I tell you what, man, she had a magnificent swing, just good looking young lady, hit everything at the flag and that sort of stuff. And I said to her in, in New York about, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. And I said, what is it? What is stopping you from going to that kicking butt? You know, I mean, it's got to be something. Can you put, can you, I can pinpoint it. Can you put your finger on what's missing? You know, it's, it's, it's not about sponsorship. If you got game, man, you don't need a sponsor. Pal. You're going to find money if you got game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, there's no doubt about it, matter. Somebody will find you. So it is something. So I think with, I think with this golf academy, I think we, we can compare it. We can get our kids in a position where we can work on the mind. Uh, we can get a personal trainer there, someone to talk to them and all that sort of stuff, man. And you know what? And, and just go from there. Just go. I'm, listen, yeah, you got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Nothing to lose. So well, you got well, nothing so, to lose. It, he's where you at. <laughs> so so one, of, one of the things that, you know, you seem like you're passionate about is growing the game. And there's something special that's happening on February 25th to the 27th of 2022. And that's the Jim Thorpe Invitation. Yes. Talk to me. What is going on? Because it seems like that is setting the path and setting the trend for uh for okay. some. Okay. What we need, the Jim Bump invitation is gonna be an event for minority kids. Okay. Many, many years ago, 1997, I think the uh, the first tee was established. And it was established to go into let's just call it what it is, into the hood, into the the into the heart of the city. <laughs> And That's get right. our African American right. kids to introduce them to this game that's called golf. But, but more importantly, we're going to introduce them to the nine core values that we come up with. And along that way, we would introduce them to the game of golf. All right. And one of the things that opened my eyes up is that we should do a golf tournament in the Pebble Beach, California, called the Nature Valley First Team Event. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we have 81 pros, 162 amateurs. And 81 juniors. So I said to Joe Lewis Barr, I said, Joe, something's wrong with this picture. And he said, Thorpey, what is that? I said, we got 81 juniors here. I can only count five African American kids. I said, something's wrong with this picture. I said, this program was designed for these kids. We don't care how they play. It's the exposure we want them to have. All right? It's, it's, the, it's the people that going to, going to talk about the nine core values. If you live your life by these nine core values, you shouldn't have any ups and downs in life. So we're going to do this jump up invitation on them. And basically what's going to happen there is we're going to invite young men, young minority women and men from all over the world, Canada, the Caribbean, the, uh, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, the West Indies. And we won't do it. <clears throat> Grab this young talent at this age. Let's say we're going to go from eight to 11 from 11 to 14, mm -hmm. from 14 to 18. And we, we want to get behind this talent to see how, where we can take it, okay? And introduce them to this magnificent game, not just the game, but introduce them to the administration side of the game. I mean, we get mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of employees that work for the PJ of America, the PJ Tour, but only a handful of blacks are so African American. So, so, so we, Jim. So with this, this with this this golf tournament and this Jim Thorpe Golf Academy, man, I, we can make a difference, all right? We can make a difference. We don't need a handful of one or two. 
So that's, that's the thing. That's the thing, Jim. And, and you just you just kind of mentioned the first T, and you may have answered the question, but I kind of want to get a a, a a clear understanding. Where, where is the, the golf academy that you're speaking of? How will that be different from the first T? Because well, you know, what, we worked on that. We have a young lady up in Saint Charles, just outside of Saint Charles, team, Florida, is willing to donate 200 acres. So, uh, so we you, actually we had a little meeting today, and. Uh, um, putting together all the logistics, you know, all the uh, the planning and what we need and what we need to do to utilize, uh, you know, to utilize guys like Mike, you know, guys like Ty, guys, people that have been around the game. And, and uh, I mean, I don't know the last time you guys played with Mike, but I played with Mike the other day. Uh, damn, he drives at 350 yards. I mean, Jesus, this guy's got talent, man. And you're, and you're, you're, alluding, to, you're alluding to Mike Jordan, Michael Jordan? No, no, no. Michael Jordan <laughs> Michael... is my man, MJ. Okay, okay. <laughs> now we talking about your mic. Oh, my mic. Okay, all right, gotcha. <laughs> so that's what we need to do, man. We need to get it up here. Hey, you can do this. You can do this. I mean, you have it in you. So, yeah. you know what? So it's something, maybe they need to be pushed harder. You follow what I'm saying? I do. Uh, you I know, for, I talked to my dad about, you know, when leaving school, talking to my dad. He said, well, boy, what you going to do? I said, Pop, I want to play golf like my brothers. You know what I mean? And he said, son, you know, you have to work hard. I said, Pops, I'm willing to work hard. I am willing to work hard. And no one is going to give it to you, man. And you know what? It's nothing like going up there earning it yourself. You know what I mean? But I want to I want to go back. You said something uh, about when you're at Morgan State and you were talking to your father. I, I read an article that um, uh, you were playing football, but you know you knew football wasn't going to be the sport for you. At that time, did you know golf? You, you had dreams of playing golf while you were, you know, hitting people, you know, from a linebacker position? Well, the thing about it, we grew up on a golf course. My dad was a great keeper, as you know. And golfers, you know, they was wearing the good looking, uh, what do you call it, the Sansa Belt slats and the Isaac and the Munson wear shirt, you know what I mean, with the with the Gator shoes and all that. Man, that's pretty cool, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> and plus you won't get I mean you won't get beat up, you know what I mean? And I'll never forget, man, and uh we, we had the football game. I don't know who we was playing or whatever, man. I fought with two or three times, man. And we got back from uh, Coach Banks. We said, come on, we're going to get you, teach you how to hold the ball and where you don't fumble and that sort of stuff. And he got the two biggest tackles we had on defense. And so, you know, from about eight yards, just run the ball to these guys. So after about the second time running the ball, getting knocked on my butt, I turned to the coach and threw him the ball and said, Coach, why don't you take this ball and run it through them two big guys? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I walked away to the golf course, man. I got me a, I got me a job at night, man. It saved my money. I got me to the golf club. The next thing you know, pal, I was on the road, man. And then, look, I'll be the first to admit it. I hustled golf for a few years, man. I hustled golf for a few years, man. I'll be the first one to admit that. And uh, there was times where you had to leave your hotel room late at night. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, there was time where, uh, you know, you knew you was in the wrong group and that sort of stuff. And and then one day I said, uh, I met a young lady, 1973. And she said to me, if you're going to do this, let's do it the right way. Mm. And that kind of turned my life around. And you know, I, I went to work in my golf game. I went to Europe and played a few golf tournaments. Got lucky enough to win over there. And I met a gentleman named Gary Player. Mm. I beat him the golf tournament over there. And he said to me, why aren't you playing the PGA Tour? I said, man, I'm not good enough, you know what I mean? And I know they've been to Q school. He said, well, I'm the top two or three player in the world. You just beat me, so that says a little something. So I came back with the Q school and marched way through, man. And wow. uh, here wow. I am today, man. But football, the football life back in them days, you were just a piece of meat to them. And I'm being honest, no disrespect to nobody. I mean, nothing malicious about this, man, but the brothers were just a piece of meat, man. They didn't make any money, man. You know, you run the football, run your heart out and do all this sort of stuff. Now, look at some of the guys today, man. You know, they walk, you know, they can't even straighten the knees up, man. They walk and, you know, me, I mean, you hurt for them, you know? And I, I'm 72 years old. I still go out and play 27, 36 holes a day. Uh, walk probably nine holes or 10 holes every day. I got a little walking bag, you know what I mean, to go out and do it. I mean, because I love the game. And But the, the thing that really bothers me is like the programs we have at my club here in, in uh, Orlando, Heathrow Country Club. 
I see yeah. all these junior kids out there, but I don't see no African American kids, man. That's, that's well, that's what we got to do, me, Jim. We got to we got to work on that, and we'll we'll all do it together. Before we let you go to wrap up our time, man. There's will, like you said, there's so many places so that much. we can go. So much we I want to unpack. Um, but two weeks ago, we lost a pioneer uh, in the game of golf. Yeah. Uh, and, and Mr. Lee Elder, I want to just ask you quickly. What was his impact on you, and and what are going to be some of your your fondest memories and takeaways from from his contributions to the game of golf? I remember years years ago, even for my brothers and I was getting ready, uh, hope they tried and play the tour and that sort of stuff. And we seen Lee Elder in a playoff. I think with Lee Tabino or Jack Nichols, one of the two. And man, we pulled for him so hard. You know, man, Jesus, man, the brothers on TV. You know, he looks the part, you know what I mean, with his red or his blue on and that sort of stuff. We're pulling for him. And I know he beat Tabino in the playoff, but I think he might have lost his jacket in the playoff. But I knew then that if he could do it, if he could do it out there, and only somebody that was with him at this this particular time, I think, well, Charlie Siffer was probably still out there, all right? Uh, and we know, you guys probably know, that Pete Brown was the first African-American player that went on the PGA Tour. Pete Brown mm -hmm. won the San Diego Open. Uh, and the Williams San Diego Open. And that, but that inspired me to watch him go out there and compete against the Caucasian guys. And you know what? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what he went through? Mm -hmm. I went through some of it, but not near as much of what he went through. The name calling, not being able to go in the clubhouse, not being able to sit and eat with the rest of the pros, change his shoes at the back of the car. Man, I mean, it's got to be mine, but it's so key. Can you imagine? I don't know how many times Lee won on the PGA Tour, but I know Calvin won 12 times. But I, I, but by the time Calvin got there, a lot of the roads had been smooth. You know what I mean? A lot of the barriers had, had been knocked down. But can you imagine if Charlie and Lee and Pete and Jimmy Dent, Teddy Rose, how would we like, and, and they could have played under the same circumstances, the same conditions that the Caucasian guys played under. Can you imagine what they could have won, man? I mean, I it's no it's telling what they could have won, man. But I mean, you know what? I mean, you show up at a hotel, then you check in, they give you a hotel room, they send you all the way around the back, you need to catch a cab to it. <laughs> and then you wake up the next morning, you see KKK on your door, we're watching you. Mm. Man, that is scary, mm. man. Death threats. You know what I mean? Just to play it off. Uh, you just know, the end word, the, you know, boy, go home and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it, it was just, I mean, I cannot imagine. I mean, listen, I faced some of it. But, you know, I I, I, I kind of let my, excuse me, I kind of let my guard club did, spoke, speak for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. By getting mad and, and then you're trying to, you, you, when you get mad and angry with that sort of stuff, you're stooping to their level. You know what I mean? That's it. So just don't allow it. that to happen. You follow what I'm saying? Because yeah. the longer you didn't touch me or put your hand on me, hey, I was cool. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So sticks and stones <laughs> break your bones. <laughs> <to work. laughs> so hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a firm you, believer of that. You, but you so know, what we're going to do, you know, with, with, you know, with the staff of guys, with my man Ty and Mike, the guys that we have now, we're going to find a way. Now, I might, you, you got to see it. I might not be around to see it, but I will see it from above. See, the plan feels to get level. We got to find a way to do this. So we need to get, listen, what we're doing, what we're doing is uh, uh, we're taking steps, all right? Now, the finish line is the future. So we got to prepare our young kids. I don't care if it's football, basketball, baseball, whatever the situation, we got to prepare them mentally mm -hmm. to go out there and let your talents float, man. And guys, yeah. you know what? Wow. Here I'm getting the ball so we can play around the golf. Absolutely. One of one of one of the sayings that yeah. I that I live by uh from James Black, uh, when it comes to preparing mentally is uh, uh physical education is one of the most important part of education. The athletic body has to find the right mind. And you know, and with that being said, Mr. Thorpe, we absolutely thank you for being here, for gracing us with your presence. Again, absolutely. need everybody to check out um, Jim Thorpe Invitational, February 25th, 27th at 2022 at uh, Champion Gate Resort. And uh, we, we absolutely appreciate your, your time and, and coming well, in and guys, talking to God us today. Be good. Hey, where my hat at? Hold on, where my Thorpe hat? I know, that's, I that's, 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 that's 1980 lettering. Tomorrow. It'll be in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> All right, All right yeah, that's that what it is. Will, can you believe? 
that this man playing in the United States Open Championship had to sleep in his own car the week of and had to eat the fruit out the locker room to sustain himself and still with a top five finish, man. Look, Jim Thorpe, and he's done it, man. He's done it all. But, but he's he, he done it all. But how can you, like, fathom to think that he was changing clothes in the parking lot, Doug? Yeah. Bro, we... We lucky, man. Bro, we, bro, we lucky, man. We, we so we, fortunate. We, we, take, we take everything for granted, man. And changing clothes in the parking lot. You know, there's a story, and, I, and I'm probably getting off beat, but I'm going to bring it back. Um, James Black, he said something to me that I'll never forget. And he's, he's in the same era as Jim Thorpe and, you know, Lee Elder and those guys. And, 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 uh, James, uh, we were coming back from a, um, a champion tour event. Uh, it was the, uh, Rock Barn, Rock Barn champion tour event out there in Hickory, North I, Carolina. I believe it. And, 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 um, and I never forget me and, me and, uh, James, we were pulling up to a McDonald's. And I said, uh, I said, James, you know, let's go do a drive through. And James was like, no, 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 no. Let's, let's park. I'm like, James, there's nobody in the drive through. Nope. It's wide open. It's quick. No, no, no we're, we're, we're parking. I said, James, no, nah, Mr. Black. No, we're going to the drive through. I got to get home. I, I'm, I'm pressed for time. And he went crazy. Like almost like Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. He just started getting upset and getting mad, cursing me out. So we went inside, got him the food, paid for the food. I'm like, get the get the old man whatever you want, man. I don't care. I'm getting tired of him. And I'm mad and I'm upset, Doug. And we get to the golf course the next day, and I'm sitting beside him, and I'm still upset from what happened uh, the uh, day prior. Because of the drive-thru. Because <laughs> of drive-thru. And, and I heard him talking to a friend of his. You know, when when, when older gentlemen get in, in, have, uh, in, in circles, they just have uh, old conversations. And you just yeah. sometimes you can pick their brain and listen. And he said, I don't mess with the drive-thru. And I'm over here listening. I'm like, I know. He said, <laughs> because the drive-thru was the back window when I was coming up. Mm. He said, man, when I, was, when I used to go to the golf course and I was hungry and I wanted that blueberry muffin, they made me go to the back window and they made me wait and wait and wait and it all came full circle yeah and so stories like that from james black and hearing stories from jim thorpe and here i'm sure and lee elder shared some stories with us man that right there shows a testament of of what they went through for us i mean it, to, to think that because we uh we have this color doug you and i we we would have to change color I mean, excuse me change clothes in the parking lot 30 40 40 years ago yeah 50 years yeah. ago Change clothes in the parking lot, Doug. I think our, our generation, Will, we, we, we did have it easier. We had our challenges, but we didn't have overt racism and bigotry in our face every day just trying to do what we want to do and be passionate about this game of golf. And and, and that's why it was important for, for me, Will, and I'm glad you, you connected with Jim, to have him on our podcast because I don't want people to forget that mm. there was a reality for black folk, people of color playing golf, uh, that they overcame so that we could have what we have today. And may those lessons and may those teachings never go unsung and Absolutely. uncelebrated because we, we have this opportunity now, you and I here, we sitting here talking about some G, but, but uh, can you imagine on. how proud Thorpe is of us? Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. We're, we're, we're on here talking about golf, man, and, provide, and, and doing our best to provide platforms for everybody, not just black, not just white, Everybody, everybody, everybody who wants to play this game beyond the fairway, want to provide that platform to give you a chance to talk about it. But one thing we didn't talk about, Doug, and I was a little bit guilty and maybe not pushing it because I didn't know where he was going to go with it. <laughs> we did. He, this is probably the first guest. We have 46 guests this year. We have 46 guests or excuse me, we have 46 episodes over 40 guests this year. Yep. And this is probably the only one that we didn't ask. The only one. Who was your rap foursome? Who was your rap foursome? So we're gonna fill in the blank. Who do you think? <laughs> who do you think? Who do you think Jim Thorpe rap foursome would be? I'm I mean, be is, it, is it is it is it Smokey Robinson? Is it is it Smokey Robinson West? I mean, who is it? Is it? A, I bet it will. I'm gonna start with Cool in the Gang. Ooh, Cool in the Gang. Okay, okay. Send the hip hop, the hip it like you know. I, I, I think, I'm gonna start I, there. Cool in the gang, number one, first off top. 
I think. I mean, you gotta think. You know, he he's really old school. He's. Re- I, I I wouldn't. I don't think. Now this is what's gonna be bad. I don't even think Jim. I don't think Jim really mess with rap because if you see how Jim moves, and if if anybody met Jim Jim Thorpe in person, the dude, the brother, the brother smooth. Like smooth. he's smooth. So I mean, he just he sl- he sl- he slows down. <laughs> and 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 he just he just has this this cadence this gait that is uh often w- want to be imitated you know so uh but yeah cool and gang you got cool and gang I got <laughs> I don't know man I don't know the 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 hip hop side of the spinners I don't know would be like <laughs> the spinners okay they the spinners that all right well I I don't know in what world you know what I'm gonna go with uh. They weren't rappers, but I felt like they could have. Could have been. Okay, who's that? I'm going with the SOS band. SOS band? The SOS band. Bro, I'm going to tell you something. I don't even know who the SOS band is. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, so you go SOS band, which I never heard of, which I probably need to go check my black card. <laughs> yeah, you uh, might. I'm about to pull it. I, I, SOS I, I, I can't wait. I can't wait till Brian, our producer, pulls up SOS band when we watch on YouTube. Dude, like, Jimmy I'm Jam like, oh. and Terry Lewis produced them. That was like the first group they produced. Yeah, bro, you still over my head. I'm sorry. I mean, right, I, w- I, w- all right, I, w- all right. I would probably think, like I said, close to rap in that day that was quick. I mean, well, a little more rappers. beat. I know, maybe, maybe, maybe Earth went in fire, I guess. A little Philip Bailey or something. Yeah, they were not a rapper, rapper we'll but they, they, we'll give them to him. That was yeah, bopping, though. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. bopping back then. I get it. Okay, okay, well, there He's you have it. All right. There you have it. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first modified version of uh, uh, Rap Foursome given to you by Jim Thorpe. <laughs> cool in the gang, the spinners, the SOS band, and, and EWF. All right, I, I'm not mad at that. Well, you know what? We've had so many things to celebrate this year and so many. Let's go ahead and get to our shank of the year, but I'm going to do it correctly. Let's... Well, f- I don't even know how to do it. Shake of the year. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, uh, oh, so-, so many shanks, Will. So many shanks. And you know what? Shout out to the people that were good sports because we did give some shanks. and I, We weren't disrespectful. The only person that kind of took it the wrong way was Trey Valentine's daddy. And you know what? Trey Valentine's no. daddy... Still gonna give you that heat. You know what? <laughs> no, you earned it. No, you earned it. I, I lo- hold on, man. If, 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 if there ever was a shank of the week that where I lost a friendship over, it was Trey Valentine. <laughs> Trey Valentine has not. I think if I think I was on fire, I don't know if he pee on me right yeah. now. But but is that but, the shank of the year? I don't know, Will. Nah, I don't know. No, that's, that's just no, one. No. You know, was, uh, man, that was, we were young, man. We were young in the game, man. We didn't know who we were going to offend. But I, Trey, I love you, man. I miss you, brother. And I, I and your dad, I love him too. So I hope. Hope he'll say hello to me next time I see y'all. That's I don't it. know. Yeah, no. Enjoy, enjoy your holidays, Trey. Um, you know, one will if if put one up there that's that that is legendary. And you you called her name out during the episode when we recorded it, but I don't remember what her name was. But it was some lady who wasn't even in the game of golf, but she got a DUI in a golf cart going up I ninety five on a Yamaha. I don't know, but that's like my favorite one. <laughs> Yo, she that got- shake. <laughs> She got pulled over, right? She got pulled over and she got DUI and went to jail and then went to her tea time the next day at uh, at, at the villages. <laughs> that might Doug, that might be shank of the year. You I know what? All name. right, we're gonna vote. Here's another one. Here's another one. And this is a real shank. This ain't even funny. The fact that Victor Hovland's mother called in a penalty on her own son. That's 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 some competition. That that but, is tough. Uh, but I tell you this, I tell you this, I, I don't know where we're going to go. I think I'm going to vote the the lady, the, <laughs> the, the bandit going down I-95 turnpike. <laughs> well, I think that is a correct answer. Ladies and gentlemen, our shank of the year. Brian, go ahead and re-roll it for everybody. My shank week goes to Carol Crispino. Who the hell is now, Carol Crispino? Well, let me tell you, Doug, I'm glad you asked. Carol last week was arrested by driving drunk in a Yamaha golf cart on the Florida Turnpike. <laughs> she was tra- she was sighted traveling 25 miles per hour on the on the Florida Turnpike. So the Florida uh, Highway Patrol pulled her over, and she she didn't have to really go into a lit a, a fully lit place because she felt safe. So that was good for her. She got pu- she got pulled over and. She openly admitted that she had a few drinks. 
and the, she quickly obliged by providing a uh, some breath samples and breath breath samples and she ended up blowing she had a blood alcohol content of 0.15 and 0.157 the alcohol legal, legal limit is 0.08 <laughs> so this resident of the villages quickly got arrested and she got bailed out next morning and I heard rumor that she made her tea time. So she went from the <laughs> she went from the she went from the cell block to the tea box. That's it. Well, I don't know where that lady was going. Right. But she had to get there in a hurry and drunk. So hey, there it is, right there. Shake of the year coming at you. So now, Doug, we have to be a bit more excited because who knows what type of shanks of the week that that are gonna come in season two for us. Oh yeah. Like we'll get I'm, I can only I'm, imagine now. I'm taking my neutrality off next year. I'm gonna tell oh. you right now. I'm, I'm gonna oh, take some oh. of my neutrality. And, we, so we're gonna are we gonna walk I'm, towards we're gonna walk towards the edge a little bit, the, the cliff a I'm little a, bit. I'm gonna look over the cliff. I ain't gonna walk. I might walk past the edge, but I ain't gonna okay. go off the cliff. Okay, That's okay. damn sure. Okay, okay. Shout out to I, Mike Tarico for that uh, great advice that he provided. Will and I. You gotta know where the cliff is, and you gotta know where the edge is. You can go over the edge, but don't go off that cliff. Yeah, dog. HR do office, HR office over here. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I won't see HR next year because I'm getting better. And the off season is broadcasting stuff. I'm gonna know. I'm gonna. Lo I'm gonna learn how to ask a question. You know what? We need to put a series of bad questions that I ask. To, uh, <laughs> to, how many to all guests, the guests will piss off this yeah, year? Yeah. How many guests that will offend? Because I think the very first question of Beyond the Fairway with Ray Allen. It was a bad question too. Or was it like, <laughs> like, are you ever gonna win the American Century? Like, <laughs> he was, But hey, asking asking Bubba Wallace if, if you know if he was an athlete, that you know what? No, it's the last I, episode. I, that I, sh was funny. No, no, I think me accusing uh, Annika Sorenstam of, of point, point shaving. <laughs> yeah, that that might have been that might have been bad too. That, that, better, be that was a bit aggressive. <laughs> hey, hey, but look, man. You know it is what it is. You take you you take you and me off the street. Give us a platform to speak to everybody within the game of golf. You know what? You never know who's gonna pull up or what we might say. So I hope y'all enjoyed this initial season out the gate. But you know what? Beyond the fairway, we will be back, people. And you're welcome now. We back. More hot takes. More discussions. More Will Lowry wearing hat backwards. That's why I wore this one backwards today. Will, I'm paying homage to you and all the contracts that you sign where you secure the fact that you can wear a backwards hat. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's called hairline insecurity, brother. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get it confused. But well, however, however, it's going to be uh, March of 22, man. March of 22, everybody, we're going to be back and uh, popping beyond the fairway. It's going to be, uh, I always you know, try to do the 10% rule. You know, how can it be bigger, newer, better, or indifferent? Somehow, Creso Collins by 10% and hopefully we'll be... Uh, Oh, we get a season three. Shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> and will look, man. We got to give credit where credit is due. Before we even get up out of here, we got to give a shout out to Brian Riley and, and Paul Kazmarichek. He got check in his name. You know, we call him Cas for taking care of us. Look, those are the only white folk on this podcast. You know what I'm saying? Besides <laughs> the guests that pull up. And shout out to Brian and Cas for what they do, putting up with me and Will this whole season. We appreciate y'all uh, more than y'all will ever know. And, and Molly Solomon, thank you so much for just giving us a shot so we'll see y'all absolutely brian and kaz had a first-hand experience of uh of culture relevance they 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 they, they heard us talk amongst ourselves and they learn they, and they learn they learn real quick about our, yeah. vernacu about our vernacular and our lingo mm -hmm. shout there's out to lot, them for there's a lot more stuff beep than they than you see here there's, there's a lot more is cut out so right. shout out to Kaz and Brian. <laughs> for not be offended the way we talk <laughs> right how because we we talk it when we do it and you know yes. what i'm glad they let us be us you know what more of that coming in the new year hey man everybody thank y'all so much rocking with us this year man beyond the fairway couldn't have been more of a success you know how to get a hold of us on our instagram beyond the fairway on ig get a hold of me on ig and twitter at the douglas fresh and will I, you always you know what's your hands uh uh will lowry golf i'm offended that you didn't know that Continue. i knew what it was i just wanted them to hear you say it because i was <laughs> on a roll you know what i'm saying hey yo thank y'all so much for allowing us this platform we appreciate you enjoying us and uh We'll be back sooner than you know us. So for us here at NBC and Golf Channel, this is Will Lowry and Dougie Fresh. Happy holidays. Bless holidays into yours and good night. Is that what Temptation's deep voice got?
And I'm out this bitch. <laughs> See, he already started out with HR. There you go. HR his ass. <laughs>